here, Greg Smith, um, for a short time still. I'll be leaving fairly soon at the end of this week. Um, but I thought since this is basically the last talk of this tutorial, or this workshop, um, I would step back a little bit and give a little bit of a larger scale view of how we use some of these techniques in a real problem, some of the challenges and some of the problems that we come across. And so the system that I'm going to talk about is Acton. Um, it's, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about that. I'm sure you've heard a little bit about it already. Um, and I'm just going to highlight some of the issues that we've had and some of the complexities in applying these models. So, in theory, if you apply force strain, it should be a pretty simple proposition. As long as you have an isotropic substance that's well sampled in simulation, um, that you can describe with pairwise interactions, and spherically symmetrical sites. But in reality, a lot of the systems that we care about have a lot of different constituents that interact in ways that aren't necessarily radially dependent only, they may be orientation dependent. Um, and these systems are difficult to simulate for long enough to get full sample. Because if they weren't, we wouldn't want to create a force grain model, we would just do all atom simulation to start with. Uh, they also tend to have non-spherical subunits, and they can undergo some slow exchange dynamics, such as uh, the systems that Anton was talking about in his previous lecture. Um, so, as I said, I'm going to talk about Acton as a model system, and I'll basically give you, first of all, an introduction to the Acton system, then I'll talk about how we've used coarse grain to analyze some of our large-scale MD simulations, and how it can be used as an analytical method. I'll talk about how we try to incorporate some heterogeneity into our coarse grain models, um, and then I'll also talk a little bit about alternate methods of identifying and characterizing states um, that are not the Markov state models that Anton just talked about. So why do we care about acting dynamics? Acting dynamics, acting is present in all eukaryotic cells, and it's really important in cell motion. Um, it forms these dynamic networks at the leading edge of the cell, and it drives the excursion of phytoclodia, um, it does cytokinesis, and it does this, all sorts of different motor functions. Now it's physically interesting because this motion is actually a property of subunit assembly. That is, acting filaments are polar, and the subunits assemble preferentially on one end, associated preferentially from the other end, and this assembly is regulated by a nucleotide bound at the core. So the way that this works is ATP bound subunits bound on one end, and the ATP is hydrolyzed in the filament, and ATP bound subunits dissociate from the other end, giving a net forward motion. So that's very different from a lot of biological systems that we think about where a subunit itself moves. Here, the movement is actually a property of collective dynamics of all these subunits. Structurally, we understand a little bit about the acting monomer. Uh, there are a lot of high-resolution structures for the monomer. Uh, these have been difficult to obtain because acting tends to polymerize under the conditions that uh, you need for, for uh, crystallization or for cryo-EM. And so all of these models have coproteins or mutations in order to prevent that polymerization. We know that there are four subject names um, at the nucleotide binds here at the core. And as I've said before, the nucleotide affects the dynamics of this subunit. Um, we've seen that based on proteolysis results and fluorescence results in the past. But if you look at the crystal structure for ATP and ATP bound acid, they're very similar. So it seems as though the nucleotide is actually regulating some sort of slower dynamics or dynamics into an excited state. These subunits also polymerize, as I showed you in the global movie, um, and the nucleotide affects the rates of those polymerizations. Additionally, when these things polymerize, it accelerates nucleotide hydrolysis by 40,000 fold, and so it's believed that this is as a result of a conformational change. But we don't really know what the conformational change is. Um, there is no high resolution filament structure. There are these two different models from cryo-EM and fiber diffraction data, and they both suggest that the subunit flattens um, during polymerization, and that flattening is believed to help accelerate the nucleotide hydrolysis. But again, the mechanism is not known. So the basic idea that you need to know to understand the rest of your work is really just that active dynamics is a multi-scale problem. We have a nucleotide at the core that alters the dynamics of the monomer, and that in, chain, in turn regulates the assembly and disassembly of the filament. And the filament assembly then forms these cross-link networks. And vice versa, stresses on the network cause cleavage of these filaments dissociation. The dissociation is also driven by the state of the nucleotide, and changes the conformation of the monomer, and the monomer conformation affects the hydrolysis of the nucleotide. 
so when we want to study this, the first thought is obviously, can we do an MD simulation of this thing? More and more, you can do larger systems, longer time scales, but still, these systems are huge. Uh, Atom filament of about 13 subunits is a million atoms. So it's a very large system. The number of atoms and the time scale that we need is just, you can't reach it. In addition, even if you could do infinitely long simulation for an infinitely long time, the number of atoms that there are just is prohibitive in terms of analysis. And so we really need a way to analyze the motion, the dynamics of these collective movements. Additionally, experimentally, we've seen that um, active subunits are actually quite heterogeneous. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what we need from the theoretical level is a way to analyze these systems on a coarse grain level and to identify and characterize states within the simulations. The second limitation, as I talked about, was just the sheer time scale required. We really can't see these F to G acting transitions, and we can't see the nucleotide-dependent dynamics. What we can do is simulate each state and then use the CG representation to reduce the subspace and compare between these different simulations. And we can also try to use coarse graining in order to simulate these states. So as I said, I'm first going to talk about the applications that we've done using coarse graining for analysis. And here the paradigm basically is, is we do simulations for as long as we possibly can. We then map that all out of data into a CG representation. And then we use that CG representation as a reduced subspace in which to do analysis. The first problem, which you guys have talked about in the on hands-on tutorials, is really how to choose coarse grain sites. Now, one of the things that you did in the tutorials is this essential dynamics coarse graining, and I'm sure you've talked about the theory of that a bit. For this system, this was not a good solution for us for a couple of reasons. The first reason was that we hadn't worked on essential dynamics coarse graining yet by the time we were coarse graining the system, so it wasn't available to us. But in addition, um, we need a consensus model for analysis. And so we need a model that we can apply, whether it's ADP bound, ATP bound, whether it's F acting, G acting, so that we can compare between these two things, or these things. Additionally, essential dynamics coarse graining gives us contiguous sites, and we wanted to be able to capture the fact that these domains are non-contiguous. So we started out with a very intuitive one site per subdomain um, representation, but we found that there were a couple of problems with this. The first is that these sites you can see are very obviously non-spherical. So trying to map an excluded volume onto these sites is very difficult. The second problem that we had is the orientation of these sites changes as the dihedral angle twists, the interactions between them change, and we want to capture that information in order to answer questions about the system. And so what we want to do is preserve some sort of internal orientation. Additionally, we have things like this D-loop, which moves a lot during simulation and is a significant part of this domain. And so it affects the center of mass of this domain. But we don't really care about necessarily exactly where this is. So we would like to filter out the noise from those very highly mobile regions. Taking those things into consideration, what we decided to do was to add in more coarse grain sites. And now these are not built in with the normal assumption of these are the rigid domains. They're built in to try to reduce the noise, to give us landmarks for orientation of these subdomains, and to give us specific contact information that we care about. For example, the D-loop makes contacts with the subunit above it, and so we wanted to make sure that that was well represented. So the bottom line here is when you're designing your coarse grain model, while it's important to include the rigid body motion as you can get from essential dynamics coarse grain, sorry, um, it's also important to think about the specific questions that you want to ask in your system and tailor the coarse grain sites, maybe on top of the central dynamics coarse grain, to include sites that answer those questions. Just for interest's sake, um, we have compared the EDC G model that's generated, um, which is shown over here um, by sequence, with the hand picked model, which I've now broken it up into contiguous regions. And you can see overall there's a pretty good agreement. Um, there are obviously more sites in the handpicked model because they were allowed to be non-contiguous. So if I split it up into contiguous regions, there are a few more. But you see, overall it does have pretty good agreement. Once we've figured out this um, analytical model or the coarse grain site assignment, we can start to ask questions about how the nucleotide might affect the conformation of the subunit. Uh, and to do that, we did all atom simulations of the filament with three different nucleotide states. And the approach that we were going to take, where we were going to compare and contrast the different angles. Um, here I'm going to focus on this twist, which represents the flattening of the subunit. If you'll remember, that was important in filament formation. 
um, the active monitor goes from a twisted conformation of this angle to a flattened conformation of this angle. And we ask the question, how does this then relate to nucleotide state? So when we do this, we can plot the radial or the probability function of these, this angle. Um, and what we see is here we've got ADP in black, ATP in red, and ADPPI in blue. You can see that there is definitely a regulation of this twist based on the nucleotide in the film. What's interesting, though, is that there is this conformation is sort of a major conformation in all of them. So if you do crystallize, you can see very easily why you would see a similar conformation for all the different subunits in a crystallization state. But what's changing is the relative probabilities of these different states. So now we wanted to create a coarse grain model from it so that we can do larger scale simulations. What are the challenges? Now clearly the first challenge is that these guys are a complex radius distribution. These actually represent 13 different subunits all mapped on top of each other. Um, and so you get these multiple minima, or uh, most likely conformations. And if we look at each subunit individually, you can see even in this case, which this is the ATP, which looks pretty harmonic, if I map each individual subunit individually, you can see that they actually span a range of different essentially harmonic potentials, and that there's slow switching between them. And so that's problematic to treat with hetero ENM because hetero ENM, you only capture a single harmonic fluctuation. And it's pretty clear that the subunits are heterogeneous. Uh, this is good news in one aspect because experimentally, as I said, there's a lot of evidence that actin subunits are heterogeneous. Um, there's very twist angles that have been known for over 30 years. Um, Cryo EM data tells us there are different modes in the filament, and more recently, fluorescence and SACS data has suggested that there's heterogeneity in the model. But the problem is to try to put this into a coarse grain model. So we've got two different sources of heterogeneity that we could think about. One is in the identity of those coarse grain sites. We've seen we might use the consensus model, but we can ask using essentially dynamics coarse grain are all of the monomers acting the same in terms of what the rigid domains are? The second sort of heterogeneity is the actual interactions between the sites, um, and RIJ basically in these harmonic interactions. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to try to incorporate these different levels of heterogeneity to different degrees, and ask how does heterogeneity then impact the long-range properties of the filament, for example, persistence length, twist angle, or torsional stiffness. Um, so just to show what twist angle is, um, if you project a line across from one filament to the other filament strand, do the same thing here. Uh, the twist angle is the angle between those two. Um, if, you project, if you look down on the z-axis, um, and the torsional stiffness would be the fluctuation of that angle. So those are all things that we can get from the coarse grain model if we do coarse grain simulations. So the first thing that we did was we said, what happens if we allow these subunits to have different dy dynamic domains? So we don't enforce symmetry of between these. Um, we use essential dynamics coarse graining. You guys have talked about that. I'm not going to go into details. But the results are, here I've just used six coarse grain sites. We've done this for a number of sites between 6 and 20. You can see that there is some sort of block-like structure where you have certain dynamic domains. And they look pretty similar, but each individual subunit here has specifically different dynamics. Um, and so this is a source of heterogeneity. We're not sure yet how important that is in the, at this point in the story. The second possible source of heterogeneity is the different interactions between these subunits. And so um, we do see that there is significant heterogeneity in those. Here we use hetero ENM. Um, and here I'm just showing results on a foresight model for clarity. Um, but you can see, for example, this three to four interaction spans a range of different KIJ values. And it also spans a slight range of different R XIJ or RIJ values. So to try to understand which of these heterogeneities was important, um, we use an approach where we designed three different sets of coarse grain simulations. In the first set, we treated all of the beads uniquely. So we used the EDCG model for each independent bead. Um, and we allowed them each to have their own unique interactions. So we used each of those from the hetero ENM model. In the second set, um, we treated all the CG sites the same. So we used the average EDCG model. Um, but we allowed CG interactions to be unique for each different subunit in the form. And for the third set, we applied a uniform model to all of them. Um, here we see the results for our 20-site model of the twist angle and the twist angle distribution. And you can see in the 
black is the MD result, and the red is set one, and the green is set two, and in the blue is set three. And so the basic point that we get from these results is that it's important to include heterogeneity, but it's far more important to include unique CG interactions than it is to include unique CG sites, which is a great simplification for us because it means that we don't need to change our model every time, but it does mean that we need to start thinking about finding different states within this simulation. Now the hetero AMM approach gave us a great number, a great amount of information about what heterogeneity is important, but this has certain limitations. The first one is that we have an arbitrary choice of the number of different subunit types. We had 13 different subunits in the filament simulation that we did, and we had each of them being a different subunit. But there's no guarantee that there are only 13 different substates, or that there are exactly 13 substates. There, some of these could be very similar. Additionally, it assumes that each subunit samples only one state. And that, as we can see from these distributions, is somewhat problematic. If you think about generating a harmonic potential to describe this distribution from this blue subunit, um, you can think it would be wider than it should be because it seems like this subunit is actually changing states between the state center here at about negative five and the state over here at about negative eight. So the challenge that we have going forward now is to try to identify and characterize these states from molecular dynamic simulations so that we can have a switching of harmonic potentials within our CG model. And so this is very much current work that we're trying to develop. Um, and the approach that we're taking, uh, for analysis at least, is to use a Gaussian mixture model. Now the idea here is that we have these radial distribution functions from the all-atom CG. And what we want to do is we want to model it as a mixture of normally distributed states. Because then we can describe each of these states as a harmonic interaction and do stochastic state switching between them when we do simulation. Uh, so this is basically just mathematically what we're doing, we're um, describing each probability distribution as a sum of normally distributed probability distributions. Um, and the algorithm that we use, the Gaussian mixture model algorithm, uh, actually finds the optimal number of states, um, the probability, the uh, most likely confirmation, the RIJ, and the variance for each state. And this gives us a way to quantitatively compare complicated distributions. So, if you remember that we looked at that twist angle, we saw that each of the states actually had a unique distribution of that twist angle, but we didn't have any quantitative way to compare them. Now, if we do a Gaussian mixture model of these, we can see that there are three major states um, in this distribution and this distribution, two states in this one. You can see that the mean, um, we see pretty similar means. We've got a negative 11 mean here, we've got a negative 8 mean in all three states. Um, and we can see that the probability of occupying each state changes. So that's exciting because it means that we can model these different states within a force grant simulation. Um, changing the nucleotide is as simple as changing the probabilities of assuming each of these states. Um, and we can also analytically say we've got a pretty meaningful way of comparing these different simulations. So as I said, this is very current work and we don't have all the answers yet. I seem to have talked a little bit fast, so we're going to be done a little bit early, but um, let me highlight what the challenges are that we're dealing with right now. Um, we do have a general theoretical approach, and I'll talk a little bit about that, about different, how to incorporate different states within a coarse grain model and get out the potentials and do the simulations for that. However, what we have as a challenge is the inflation of the possible number of states. Um, if you think about this Gaussian mixture model, if we generate two or three states for each of these coarse grain variables, um, and we have 33 to 36 variables for coarse grain, a 12 side coarse grain model. You have 2 to the 33 or 2 to the 36 different combinations of those. And that's problematic. Uh, so, what we want to look at going forward is whether these states actually are independent or whether we can collapse that huge space of different combinations by saying, okay, we only see a specific twist angle state if we also have a corresponding distance distribution in specific place. And that hopefully will collapse greatly this number of states. And the other thing that we want to ask using a large number of coarse grain simulations is how important is heterogeneity in each of these variables? If I lock all of the variables into their most likely state, except for one, and I'm not to change, how does that affect the filament properties that we see? Um, and how significant are those changes? And then finally, one of the things that we're looking at is going beyond these purely harmonic models, particularly for interactions between subunits. So to summarize, um, I've talked a little bit about some of the challenges we had in 
to the selection of core strength sites. And the approach that we've taken um, is to start from the core domains or the regions, isolate highly mobile parts, think about orientation and shape information that we want, and add sites to, to address these two issues. Additionally, I talked a little bit about how we incorporated heterogeneity into our model uh, to evaluate how the importance of that. Um, and it is an important factor, especially if you have limited sampling in your simulations. Um, and there are advantages to EDCG and heterogeneity in, in this step, um, but I also mentioned some of the limitations. I'm glad that I talked about some of the work that we've done in identifying states, and that's something that you guys might want to think about for your systems. And in addition, we're looking at adding states into CD models so that's still very much in progress. Um, thank you to Greg, both the CMTS members, it's been great working with everybody here. Jane Fan, who did a lot of that heterogeneity work, um, and the rest of the world group. And if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> so a couple of quick things before uh, coffee.